Hello, everyone. So it's nice to be back in Canada. I normally don't do this. Sure. I normally don't appear in like uh, public gatherings like this in in Canada. I'm usually like giving talks and talking about my ideas somewhere in Europe or maybe United States. So it's nice to see that the country where you studied art and spent a lot of your life finally is like acknowledging your voice and providing you a platform to discuss some of your ideas. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with 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 how how I about my career, my career for a larger part, especially developing as a curator, since since I since I graduated from UBC, had a lot to do with my activities online. I had very little to do with like sort of like holding like physical exhibitions or like or like working at a working at an institution as a curator. I basically found my way to what I do through my uh, activities online, whether it was the social media or the the sphere of the web, because it was very clear to me at the end of my studies that like that like that the opportunities for what I wanted to do do not exist in the physical world, and I have to seek them in the, in the virtual world. And I will end my talk, I will get more into like what I'm, what I'm uh, professionally involved with, uh, my, my role as the, as the co-director of the New Center for Research and Practice, which is an online platform. It's, a, it's, a, it's an art institution, and we're based, right now we're switching our base from uh, Detroit to Washington State. So, but, but we are a public art institution, Nonprofit society that provides art education and uh, art education to larger larger public. So we will get into that, and I'm and I'm using the new center as one of the three examples that I'll talk about in terms of smaller institutions who basically have been are, are using the internet or have been like pioneers in in using the the, the 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 realm of the digital to basically make an impact in the real world. So, so where are we now? Today, 25 years since Mosaic, the first graphic web browser was launched at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And 24 years after the first international World Wide Web Conference, uh, in reaction to the University of Manitoba's intention to charge licensing fee for their own web alternative protocol named Gopher, made the, made the internet free and public and established www, HTTP, and HTML technologies as purely public and free. And it's also 25 years after the Virtual Museum of Computer Art as the first virtual museum was founded as a nonprofit corporation on the charter from the New York State. And um, so we're, we're at this 25 year, at this 25 year turn when it comes to like the arrival of the internet. And can we ask some very basic, but perhaps uncomfortable questions? about these institutions, or public art institutions, in the time of political and technological transformations, and propose fundamentally new approaches to how digital computational and network technologies can truly transform not only the technical and procedural processes of exhibiting art, but perhaps go even further and disrupt the economic and political functions of public art institutions to further benefit both artists and the members of public. To catch up with the acceleration of technological advancement in today's world and to plan a viable future, the public institution of art have been forced into a situation, this is very important, this comparison, if, I, if you can keep it in mind, not unlike what public libraries faced 25 years ago with the advent of the internet, a challenge in which libraries did not fare really well because they lost ground as the main historical organs of indexing knowledge to emerging search engines, which are unfortunately privately owned like Google. Today, our public art institutions face a similar challenge in respect to the rise of big data, algorithms, automation, and artificial intelligence. And their inactions or wrong moves can jeopardize their historical, law, historical role as the keepers of our artistic and cultural heritage. And it's not as if public institutions of art have not already spent a great amount of their resources on technological development and expansions like managing their web presence, uh, developing digital archiving of their of their collections or their archives, exhibiting digital art, and developing other web-based projects and mobile apps for their institutions. 
But if technology is supposed to truly disrupt the already established physical ways of producing and distributing art, then why underneath these new technological interfaces that our, our institutions are adopting, why are they still functioning in the same manner as in the analog age or the analog past? Is it that beneath the veneer of technological advancement relies old networks of communication and execution, resistance to change? Institutions caught between useless bureaucracy and insider relations, based on opaque networks serving the interests of the cosmopolitan elite who collect art and professional class who frame this art and business and bureaucratic classes which are in real charge of the institutions of art in terms of funding. Why the process of managing our material culture, so rusty and at the same time unregulated, opaque and medieval, can technology, rather than covering up these shortcomings, actually function as an agent of change? Let's think back at the 25 years, these 25 years, and ask how our public institutions of art have coped with the force of technology and to what ends. The internet promised us to liberate knowledge from the hands of publishing empires and big research libraries who own substantial amounts of written knowledge and instead making them available to everyone. The internet promised to liberate images of art from the hands of copyright holders as well as large museums and galleries allowing everyone to have access to them anywhere, anytime. It's a crucial change that took place in this, in this regard because if you remember like 30 years ago or 35 years ago, if you heard a name of an artist, a new artist, it would have taken you a long, long time before you could actually see what these people are doing. These days, it won't take you more than a minute before you put a name in Google, in your mobile phone, and you have like a lot of their work at Google, on Google Images available to you and you can quickly come to a judgment about what you're looking at. And this is like a, it's an incredible, incredible change. And the internet promised to democratize the profession of writing, the professions of art writing and art making as the means of, means of the production of knowledge and artistic, artistic production, creating conditions under which anyone could potentially be a writer or an artist. So on the first promise, many books and publications have been made available, in most cases free on the internet. On the second promise, and as far as images are concerned, internet has more or less fulfilled its utopian promise. Our image web, consisting of billions and billions of searchable photographic images, have been much more available and accessible, and more often than not, completely free. And on the third promise, the internet has to some degree democratized the production of art by making the tools of production available to everyone. But it also has imposed a rigid system for quantifying the value and accessibility of digital art and culture, being private sector. Our YouTube stars of today, whose lives depend on the number of views and likes they receive from their audience, testify to the limits of the quantitative economy of attention that internet has imposed on creativity. What is the technological, but what is the technological, technological legacy of our own public art institutions? After 25 years of active professional service in this sort of like new ecosystem, one, using the internet as the intellectual, governmental, and commercial plantation for gatekeeping the general cultural policy of the state, private sector, and professional class. Two, expanding digital archives exponentially, but treating them as the symmetry of the past and not the living and changing force of the future. Three, adding the power of their web and social media presence to that of their brick and mortar advantages, only to leverage their position against each other and smaller players in the field. Four, perpetuating digitally the same monocultural star system for artists that they have historically maintained through exhibitions and collections. Four, protecting, five, protecting the right of powerful stakeholders of art to dictate art history. Six, fostering professionalization without really offering it to everyone. Those painful bureaucratic metabolisms made out of emails spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations covered in humans' cognitive blood. Seven, tolerating transplant commercialism's cross-pollination of artistic disciplines, historic periods, and aesthetic genres as a colonialism of not just the racial, ethnic, and the geographic, but the coloniality of the very local and vernacular, at the, at the very local and vernacular levels. Th this is really what, what Zeynab was really referring to also, is that this, this condition has basically caused 
art to, as it proliferates and takes over, becomes less and less impactful and meaningful. And really, the category of meaning is one of the biggest things that is kind of in danger of, of losing, losing significance in terms of what is art and what we do. And basically, that chart about like art becoming tool, this is, this is the process in which this, this meaning making and the ability of the art and artist to assert meaning is completely lost to the process. So, so one, of the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the challenges would be to ask how to, how to deploy technology, not only to sort of like speed up the process or make it democratic or make it opaque and transparent as we get more into my, my presentation, but how to, how to use it to restore the artists and arts, arts exclusive right to making new meanings that already doesn't exist in culture. Using, um, number eight, using digital technologies to further measure the institution's assets and activate and activities while more or less failing to use this quantification towards a qualitative transformation of the dominant relations within and without the institution in its dealings with both artists and the members of public. So basically, maybe if, if, if it's just too abstract, but by this, what I mean is that even though, even though technology is being used to speed up the process of exhibition making, but, but the political infrastructure of a museum have not been able to absorb all, everything that technology can offer, so the change remains on the surface and doesn't really deeply penetrate these old ways in which, in which curators, museum directors, and other people in, in, in the institution tend to think about think about the display of art and its presentation to public. Hopefully the list of these achievements that I, that I counted can also act as a list of failures and betrayals of our institutions. So at this point, we can skip the negative and instead consider what still can be done before it's too late. In my opinion, the first change of attitude consists of deepening our understanding of what technology can offer to our public art institutions. Our communication technologies have evolved from being only able to publish digital content on the web to constant data exchange and modification as well as record keeping between infinite nodes around the world on a 24 hour and a seven day a week basis. In most other social activities except the art management, algorithms and automations are slowly replacing manual operations by humans, but in the arts an ever reliance on personal human judgment, the traditional human networks accompanied by our historical limitations as humans are still the driving force behind the actual working of institutions. Even though change always begins at smaller institutions, public art institutions are the ones favored by government, private and public sector investors. And since large scale automation and democratization of art cannot be initiated from small organizations only, we do have to reform our larger and speak to public public art institutions to sort of like begin looking at smaller institutions and what they're doing and somehow create a way, way of adopting some of these strategies and innovations that smaller institutions have been, have been uh, already experimenting with. So now, here is very important to make this distinction between art and culture as someone who still, who still uh, believes in, in, in a separation between the two and a kind of like a avant-garde mission for art in my opinion, art stands tall against culture from which it emerges. But by the same token, it eventually is absorbed back into culture as artifacts, documents, and monuments mostly managed by our institutions, mostly public institutions. Culture, as second nature, operates smoothly, acting according to a complex cybernetic logic with its very own mathematics. But art is a trap like a negentropy that corrupts this smooth mathematics of culture to create new epistemic, cognitive, and political breakthroughs. This is what we call new meaning. But what happens when the speed of art's absorption by culture accelerates? During the last 100 years, technological acceleration has helped fill the ever-vanishing gap between art and culture with what we used to call pop. And this phenomenon that rears its new interface to the, as the notion of virality on the web in the context of the social media. Virality with its own binary opposition to high 
and our critical culture and its relative autonomy from larger forces which attempt to shape what is popular. Public art institutions need to understand that not only internet popularizes ephemeral cultural artifacts, but that these fleeting flashes of culture can mediate the tension between high culture's stable and fortified star system and the more democratic and unstable star system of the popular cultures. Um, so these two can be mediated and our pu public art institutions have to respond to, to, to this notion of virality and how, how virality can somehow be deployed in order to sort of like create a new public space for dissemination of art and dissemination of culture. It's a, it's a very big topic and I hope we can get into it in some of the more workshops and discussions of, of, of the pros and cons of, cons of the notion of virality, which is basically pop culture at a much larger scale and much larger and global and 24-7 scale. But, but the most important aspect that, I, that I'm here to talk about is the sort of like an algorithmic approach to the question of technology. According to media theorist Lev Manovich, and I'm quoting, quoting straight from him, the explosion of data and the emergence of computational data analysis as the key scientific and economic approach in contemporary societies create new kinds of divisions. Specifically, people and organizations are divided into three categories. Those who create data, both consciously or by leaving digital footprints. Those who have the means to collect data and the third group are those who have the expertise and resources to analyze it. The first group include pretty much everybody in the world who is using the web and or mobile phones. The second group is smaller, and the third group is even much smaller. We can refer to these three groups as the new data classes of our big data society. The quotation ends. These divisions also exist in the arts, these three classes of people and institutions. Before offering algorithmic access to data, our public institutions have to create and test systems internally. The lack of algorithmic infrastructure for, I mean, I mean what I'm trying to say is like, art institutions are even, them, even large public art institutions are themselves at the second level, and they're not even, have not even tapped into the potentials at the, at, at, at the third level, which is like realizing how data analysis and how connecting the, the wealth of information that's already at their disposal can enhance their operations and hopefully also transform them politically. And then and how this, this whole system can then be somehow offered to artists and, and members of public to empower them and to change their relationship with not the institu institution, but what the institutions hold as art and as culture. So even before offering it to the public, they have to create and test these systems internally. But, but we lack those systems. The lack of algorithmic infrastructure for analyzing art institutions' digital assets put our public institutions of art in the second of Manovich's categories. This is why we need to reevaluate the significance of publicly accessed institutional, institutional digital archives in light of the exponential growth of big data and understand that without building a specific data analysis tools, archives are only the first step. And we're just basically where we stopped. This data analysis cannot be limited to art assets though. Basically like a, a, an algorithmic understanding of, of our archives and what we hold is not enough. Digital work relations at the museum and record keeping of museums also have to be, be connected together. These all should be linked to digital information about collections, exhibitions, and other public activities of the institution to create a holistic picture of what is really has happened historically in an institution. Once this task is done, even those who are in charge of our museums at a very like, high management level, they begin to have a different understanding of what, what they've been working on for a, for a longest time. Because these type of information, these type of images only emerge after you are able to connect what you know about your institution historically and, and ask for particular models to be developed using technology so then they can show you, for instance, how many male artists have you been showing in the last 50 years? How much art from women have you been collecting? What kind of publics have you been able to, uh, to, to attract? And et cetera, and et cetera. And, and the list, list, list of the kind of like 
unasked questions that these systems can actually answer for you even before you've asked the question is just itself is like limitless. It is no longer suffice to only archive the existing collections, have social media presence, and advertise with, um, with an online mailing list like Eflux. It is time to entrench a digital way of thinking and working in the institutions. Implementing algorithmic access in one institution is like, it's like the impossible task of building socialism in one country. For change at this scale to be effective, it has to be adopted by a consortium of institutions which are committed to pulling together ideas and materials and resources, be it their assets, expertise, or technologies, to build the digital infrastructure of the future which enables algorithmic access for both artists and members of public. After, after, after these systems are built and tested, then they could be, parts of it at least, could be made available to public. And, and artists who, will, who, who can use these as a way of social mobility, as tools for social mobility. This type of platform institution building would allow our institutions to collectively achieve more than what they can on their own. This network can then be offered to smaller art and nonprofit organizations as junior partners, which then allow the pooling of their data and their algorithmic resources, however little, to be plugged into the larger network. Another highly important application of algorithmic access to data is how it can be deployed to alert us about the hidden and unconscious prejudices of public art institutions, be they in collecting, hiring, or exhibiting aspects of the work. Access to the institution's data algorithmically will, for example, determine if an institution's collecting, hiring, and exhibiting practices foster exclusion of certain groups. It can help us understand the biases of institutions in supporting artists belonging to a particular collector, commercial gallery, and private sector interests. Because once these things are mapped out, it's very easy to see how a career trajectory moves across institutions, what kind of artist networks have been behind fostering a particular practice or a particular medium, and what kind of interest these things will serve in the larger pictures within and outside of the institution. From the perspective of the user, an average user being a member of public or an artist, the most fundamental advantage they will have in such a digital environment will be their ability to compare their own data, what they know about themselves, against the available collective data that this public art institutions are making available to them. So being able to somehow overlap theirs to the institution and trying to draw some kind of meaning out of that in, in order to like understand where they stand in terms of in terms, of, in terms of a member of public, a tax-paying member of public, and in terms of being an artist who are always in a precarious position of competing against other artists and other types of cultural activity to gain traction. By providing the public a full algorithmic access to their infrastructure, these public institutions can create a collective space for artists which can be utilized to act not only as a virtual research facility, but almost as a trade union. You know, like at, at, the, at the level of artistic practice, it's very hard to bring artists together to think of themselves as a, as, a, as a profession. Institutions and collectors, whether these institutions are public or private, are always, whether they want or not, are, are vying artists against each other. If the artist A gets the show, the artist B won't get the show. It's very hard to create a sense of solidarity even among, among, among artists who work in the, in the art field. So, 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 so such fostering of these type of virtual spaces would allow artists to think of themselves in an abstract manner as belonging to a class with certain demands, with certain, with certain needs that then, that then this institution can both facilitate their understanding and also facilitate their delivery. Enabling users to compare their own information against the available collection data allows the cybernetic of culture to be turned against its original function. So if, if in the beginning we were talking about how, how, how the, the, these, these, uh, the process of culture is more, the, the, the pro, the, how culture is more like nature and how, how art sort of like disrupts this, this process can actually turn this entire cybernetic and culture-like operation in the favor of art and put at least parts of it in the service of the artist. There's also a few other uh, suggestions I would like to put on the table, which we can develop later, and hopefully if, if there, there will be a publication, this can be developed further. Use the technology to break the traditional systems of artist promotion. 
make use of technology to lobby for change in government policy for art. And then the most important one being in curatorial practice. In fact, this, this is a discussion I, I've opened up by writing a long essay about uh, algorithmic curatorial practice and its, its pros and cons. This, b b what I mean by this is, um, to put it this way, curatorial practice is the most significant Curatorial practice is the most significant black box of all processes at the institution. Nobody really understand or know why a curator pick a certain group of artists or decides to work with that artist or this artist or how these, the how these thematics are formed and how artists are placed in particular thematics when it comes to larger group shows. Um, and, and this process, the, the, the curatorial process itself, even though it's very algorithmic, it has been immune to technological transformation. Surely internet research and electronic mail have shifted the operational aspects of curatorial work, but the selection of artists and the arrangement of artistic practices in exhibition-friendly categories have stayed immune from algorithmic automation and scrutiny. And um, by, o by opening up these processes and by exposing them to the logic of to the logic of data analysis, I think the curatorial practice can both sort of benefit from much more interesting research and also more egalitarian results in terms of exhibition making. The, the perfect example of this is, is the latest art controversy going on in Germany right now is the, the Dusseldorf Museum uh, organized an exhibition around the topic of fake news and conspiracy theories but somehow ended up having a 99% all white male artist list and only one woman. And, uh, and of course, the opposition to this came up on the internet. Candy Spritz, a South African artist who was re represented in the country in, in the last Venice Biennale, wrote a long post, posted it to the institutions, this is the public art institution, posted it to the institution's Facebook, complaining that what kind of research, what are you trying to say when you, when you create a show about such an important and pertinent political topic, but you only have white men represented in the show. The museum deleted their post and blocked her from making, making extra posts. So then, but immediately, the space of the web was utilized by Candice and other friends to develop a, a letter signing campaign that actually a lot of the artists in the show ended up signing because even though they were in the exhibition, but they were appalled by the, by the kind of lazy curating that had gone on into the organization of it. And then at the end, once this became like a larger issue and the art press started reporting on it, the museum had to respond. And then their respond basically, I mean, my, my point was like, you, you are either trying to say that uh, no other group of, no other category other than white men have anything interesting to say about conspiracy theories and fake news, which is interesting because actually conspiracy theory is totally like the obsession of white dudes, right? So on a joke level, it's actually true. It's their topic. But it's either that or you're, or you're trying to say that like um, thematic exhibitions can be organized just by focusing on whatever person the curators already is, has developed relationship with. And it's not, it's too risky to get out of your own research trajectory to look at other artists and of, to look at other artists from other groups to see if they had something interesting to say. And of course, the museum was forced to apologize and, and admit that they, they're, they're, they were doing a lazy job of curating and they have to expand. So imagine if, if these tools were available to them, if, if you could easily, easily find out who are the artists who are particularly working with a certain topic and certain, certain, certain issues, and you could sort of like bring them together and make the, like basically speed up the process of research so you don't end up with this kind of situations. And I mean, we're talking about left fighting the left. This is not like some right wing museum director who's intentionally trying to like exclude minorities. It's just another good doing, uh, progressive professional who's not really adequately doing the job and I think technology can be helpful in, in making people who don't intend harm not cause further harm. So at the end of my presentation, I would like to end with three organizations and a particular look at, at their sort of like utilization of the internet to sort of like See, see how larger public institutions can benefit from, from, the, 
from what technology offers. You probably are familiar with Eflux, right? Everybody knows Eflux, right? These guys started with a show at a, at a hotel room and a basic list of fax numbers and mailing lists. And within 10 years, t um, t looking at this not as a limitation but as an advantage, they basically, Eflux, used the internet to develop not only like the, the interesting thing here is like, is like we have to think of technology as, as, a, as a system that both has outputs and inputs, right? So uh, deploying technology for only one way of doing things, either output or input, usually, usually ends up uh, exhausting your resources. So a good way of managing technological, technological advancement is to think of how input and output can be managed at the same time with the same type of technologies that you're, you're investing in. So for instance, if you use Eflux, th th their model is very clever. They have a journal that is a discursive tool. They hire and pay very well to thinkers and writers from around the world to write material around certain topics and issues. But the magazine itself is almost a nonprofit society, right? But what it does is it legitimizes the advertising the advertising economic base of Eflux, right? So this artist collective was able to create a, a system in which an advertising agency that basically is just like any other advertising agency uses its power of discourse production as a legitimizing force to make sure respectable institutions, respectable galleries will choose them for advertising their events. So from, so from one end, the, 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 the income is from the advertising but then the, the money made in the advertising, it puts towards nonprofit activities like Eflux magazine or the exhibition program that they had for a while. And that exhibition program itself is kind of interesting to talk about because for, for, for almost a decade, they ran an exhibition program in New York, uh, uh, either like showing touring, critical touring exhibitions, like the stuff that Anson Frank did with, with um, with, uh, what was that, that very seminal show of his, um, animism. But then they kind of like said, okay, let's get rid of the space because we're getting more, more, more virtual and we don't need to have a physical space. And then they, they shut down the exhibition program, but recently they've kind of like figured out a new way to restage the, the space as a space of conversation. So basically, the old exhibition space is converted into a, um, yeah is converted into a room like here, but very, very much geared towards the internet broadcast. They invite guests from around the world. These guests will give lectures to a physical, in a physical space, but these lectures are broadcasted online and hundreds of people can watch them live. And then these videos are uploaded and creates more traffic for their, for their web. And again, further, further legitimizing their critical stance in relation to their, to their advertising business, which is basically funds all the other activities that they do. And as you might not know, Eflux is basically a private corporation. They're not even nonprofit. They're like an artist collective, very successful artist collective, who are running this multifaceted business that has both input and output in terms of digital activity. The second institutions I would like to, if I can get the slide working, I'm really sorry about this. Okay, I think I got it is the institutions that I founded in the um, in, in United States in 2004. It's in, in its fifth year of operation now. We're called the New Center for Research and Practice. Basically, what, 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 what my goal was, was twofold. One was to create a space for sort of like graduate level discussions about art, art theory, aesthetic philosophy, political thought, media and technology. And basically not go against the, the existing academia in humanities and art, but somehow develop a virtual school or virtual platform around academia that works with people who are on the edges of the academia, which are people who, whose, whose own theories are not really accepted by, say, Ivy League or other universities in which they work. So they they're normally are teaching regular stuff but their research interest lies outside of what they teach. So they seek spaces like us to discuss and find audience for what they are thinking. 
and also use it as a space for younger artists and younger graduates of humanities and art history to actually teach their dissertations right after graduation without wait. So what, what I do is like I curate both like um, tenure professors and mix my programming with younger scholars who are just coming out or, or artists who are, who are getting traction. They, and then our, our seminars happen online. We are pretty much like a university. Our, uh, we only have 15 students, 15 students in each seminar, so the discussions are very small and tight. And um, our audience are basically people who are already in academia, who are students who are studying PhD and masters in, in art, art practice, but they feel that the university, their physical university is not able to offer them everything that's going on around the topic they're researching. So, so they usually get grants from their program or from their supervisor to attend our seminars. So our economic model is basically work around the, around the existing physical university to provide more, more education opportunities and more research opportunities for people who are already in universities, but they feel that university is not fully satisfying them. In addition, the space also is open for all kind of para-academic, older or younger people who do not want to engage with academia directly and they find the space interesting. And then, of course, being, being, phys being virtual means our professors could teach from anywhere in the world with a high-speed internet access, and our students or researchers can also come in from anywhere in the world at any time because you don't have to go anywhere. You just turn your computer on and you attend these live seminars. Another benefit of, of our system, which has made us very popular, is that unlike fantastic university seminars that if you miss them, you're never going to be able to relive them or, or, or know exactly what happened, if you miss a seminar, all seminars are recorded and archived under the, under the classrooms, so you can always go back and watch what you missed as a student. We also have a membership level in which people who do not want to like, engage directly live conversations can basically uh, subscribe to our video archive and basically watch the four years of, four years of uh, seminars that have unfolded from 2014 to now. And, and this semester, we just began our fifth year of operation. And in the last five years, the interesting thing about it was like, right in the first semester, we were able to pay everyone with the money that was brought in by users, small payments, without grants, without any government or NGO help. The institution held itself until we started to gain more legitimacy and we just received our full nonprofit status in US. So now we can actually apply for bigger grants and develop our digital infrastructure further. So that's another example. And then the third example I wanted to, sh I wanted to talk about is this initiative called Digital Earth, which started in, in Netherlands. And these are, these are some of the people involved with uh, the institution called HIFUS. I don't know if you, if you, if you know what HIFUS is. It's like a Dutch-based funding agency that provides funding for all kind of like politically motivated art and culture activities around the world. So really, and then what, what Digital Earth has done for the first, for the first iteration is to just get, receive money from HIFUS, who itself gets grants from like Ford Foundation, Soros Foundation, and other, other foundations. But the interesting thing about them is that they're trying to like Make, make the space of residency, remake it in the digital world. So right now they brought 17 very bright uh, artists from mostly Southern Hemisphere, China, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Middle East. And, and I've given these people a residency at Digital Air. But rather than spending the money on airplane ticket and bringing them to Netherlands, they, they've given them money to basically stay where they are and produce bodies of work and receive mentorship, studio visits, and seminars via the web. And um, us at the New Center are working closely with Digital Earth to provide two particular seminars for them that I'm leading. One of them is called um, Theories, of, Theories of Knowledge Today, and then the other one is called Art Today. For the Theories of Knowledge Today, I've put together a seminar of like nine session seminar, each one led by a by a thinker or a philosopher or a scholar who has made a major contribution in the last five years to their field. And for the art one, I've organized a nine-session seminar with curators and artists who have done the similar thing in their field, like 
documenta curators and, and other artists and people in my network. And, and the residents of Digital Earth, it's, it's really wonderful. They come from, like, say, as far as Laos in, in, in Nigeria, uh, South Africa, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, India, and they all come together in these seminars and, and interact with our instructors. Plus, they meet their mentors online and receive sort of like whatever they need from them. And at the end of the day, I think we're thinking of finding a space to exhibit their work and, and we're working on developing a collective writing project with all the 16 people to be published. Now, I'm not bringing up these smaller institutions as sort of like the, of course, larger institutions have lim limits and limitations of how they can embrace these changes. But there are, there are a lot of lessons to be shared and a lot of like, a lot of like things that the resources that people that 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 smaller and more virtual organizations can share with larger and more more public and physical brick and mortar organizations we were talking in a in a hallway with one of our colleagues who will, who will present today I, I i'm bringing a young theorist from new york to berlin with a with a collaboration with a Prague Academy of Art, because New Center and the Prague Academy are forming like a collaboration in which Prague, Prague, our Prague students can take our seminars and then use it towards credit uh, at the academy. So we, we brought this, this thinker and a y very young, bright thinker, African-American feminist thinker from New York to come to Prague and Berlin for two talks, one for my institution and one for, one for uh, Pr Prague Academy. And I was... The first limitations that I face every time is where to host this physically. And I send out a whole bunch of emails to institutions around in Berlin trying to find a gallery or a space to host this. And I almost gave up because I never received a reply. But now that, now that we're in a phase of like really crunching the dates to, to write it, I'm receiving like emails from like my top choices. Sorry, we've been so busy. Yes, we want to host it. Please, let's do it. And it's like... Why is it taking you three weeks to respond to an email? Of course, you can say that the, that the load of email and, and the lack of resources, right? But these are the exact things that you can find ways to streamline and automate and basically make your resources available to smaller, to smaller and more sort of like digital initiatives and, and activities that lack what you have and then hopefully share something of theirs that you think you don't, you don't, you lack, for, for instance, the ability to bring in audience and engage other types of publics that your institutions have yet tap into. So this is sort of like what I, what I would like to end my, end my talk with these three examples and hopefully we can maybe get further into the stuff I brought up. <laughs>